Welcome to the Kupferberg Holocaust Center. My name is Arthur Flug. I'm the director. We're delighted to have you here. And I'd like to introduce our president, Dr. Diane Call. Thank you. Well, welcome. Welcome to Queensboro. This is a very, very important project on behalf of Queensboro Community College Kupferberg Holocaust Resource Center. We are so pleased to partner with the Korean American Civic Empowerment Group. And certainly, Mr. Kim has been a leader in bringing to the attention of the world the victims of World War II of what, for many people, uh, was not a well-known atrocity, which were the comfort women in Korea who were taken, I'm being yelled at for the sound. <laughs> Here? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Our <coughs> college prides itself on community partnerships. We're a community college. It's self-explanatory. For our students who come from all over the world, this is an opportunity for them to learn history, to learn the prejudice. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> that can lead to extraordinarily horrifying results. No? Better? Uh, thank you. In addition, it brings some small sense of honor to the women who've suffered terribly and whose plight is denied among many circles to this day. We appreciate the support of our legislators who are here from New York City, from Albany, Assemblyman Brownstein, excuse me, Representative Ron Kim, State Senator Tony Avella, and I'm, I know there were representatives from others who were in, in attendance or will be. <coughs> this is something that we share as a responsibility as members of a community to educate against prejudice, to recognize the victimization of these women, and to make sure that their story is told and remembered and acknowledged, and that they are given small measure of justice, some small measure. But our students who will be the interns in this program have made a historic first, which is to engage as students in America with the women of Korea. And you'll hear more about it. We're very, very proud of our students. They come from all over the world, and they bring a great richness of diversity and history. And they'll bring forward the story of these women, which is very, very vital. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cole. <laughs> Thank you very much. And now I'd like to call on our partner from the Korean American Civic Empowerment, Dong Chang Kim. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Dr. Diane Cole and Dr. Arthur Flug. And I'd like to thank all distinguished guests and reporters for attending this historical event. I'm very pleased to present the Asian history interns and the results of their progress. As you know, this internship is the first of its kind in the US and may even be the first in the Western world. The Kafferberg Holocaust Center and the Korean American Civic Empowerment has, have been working together for the Kumpel Woman survivors for the past three years. This partnership is very unique and important for the Asian American community and human rights, women's rights, community worldwide, because through this partnership, we will bring justice to the Kumpel Woman survivors in East Asia countries, and to the women suffering from human trafficking and sexual slavery in the past, present, and the future. I want to ask the interns and all guests present here to remember the comfort woman survivors' testimonies and become active advocates for them. This internship will and needs to be continued next semester and next year, 
and forevermore to teach our next generation about the importance of human rights. We need your support, not just from your heart, but also, your, but also from your purse. I'd like to, I also like to thank the interns for their hard work, their hard work during the semester. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Doc. <coughs> thank you Mr. Chen, very much. Uh, to give you a background as to what took place and what we're doing, uh, last Wednesday night, when I came home about 9.30, I walked into the house and my wife said, why are you smiling so? We didn't win the lottery this week. And I said, no, we did something better. I said, I just left the offices of CASE, the Korean American Civic Involvement, and what we did was something that has never been done before in the United States, and you're absolutely right, Mr. Kim, when you said we did something historic. I don't know how to do it because it's a generational thing, but the staff at CASE was able to hook up a video connection to Seoul, Korea, to the house of sharing where the comfort women reside and spend their days, and the end of the hookup was on 147th Street and Northern Boulevard in their office. So what they were able to do was to do something never done before. Sitting in Flushing, eight of our interns were able to interview Korean women who were victims of World War II, and it was just as though they were sitting together in the same room asking questions. We had an interpreter who was excellent, and he interpreted the questions, the women answered, and he interpreted the answers. It was a very, very moving thing because these students were coming to face with history. And they were coming to face with a group of women who were not only telling them their story, but were asking them to do something specific. And we got the students to this point because we are very, very fortunate. In working with CASE, we came across an educator, very effective, very knowledgeable of Asian history, Korean history, and the issue of the comfort women, and that's Dr. Jimin Kim of Columbia University, and she has been meeting with our student interns during the course of the semester, and they have been giving them knowledge <coughs> regarding this. And Dr. Kim, I'd like you to come up and you can give the people an overview of what the internship was like, and then we can have our students, okay? Thank you. Uh, since we had our first meeting in October last year, we, uh, for 12 weeks, we discussed the general context of East Asian history, and um, war Second World War in East Asia, and uh, war crime issues. And our nine student interns um, actively participated in um, the discussions on comfort women, forced laborers, and other um, war crime issues, and also uh, unresolved issues to this day. So uh, at the end of the 12 sessions, they, they are already smart students, but they were ready to meet with survivors and interview them. Um, so for the last two weeks, they conducted interviews with comfort women in Korea and also uh, war crime survivors, or also met and interviewed with war crime survivors in the local area. And those war crime survivors in the local area are mostly from Hong Kong and Korea. And um, our students promised the survivors that they would remember their stories and um, let they make the stories known to others too. And they are here today to um, tell you those stories in front of you. Now, uh, let us watch some video clips and scenes from our um, interviews with comfort women in, uh, by, via Skype. So first, First, our comfort women survivor was Ok Sun Lee, and interviewers were Alexander Krombas and Lauren Hussey, our interns. And I will show you a short video clip from the interview. 
중보름 갔다 오다가 예. 음, 남자가 둘이 어, 앞에 와서 턱 막았었어요. 예. 걔참 깜짝 놀랐어. 누군지 몰라서 그걸 예. 들고 보니까 남자가 둘이 와서 무조건 그래서 네 이름이 뭐야? 어디로 가는 거야? 이것도 문도 안 하고 예. 무조건 팔 하나 하나씩 끌고 그냥 갔어요. So when she was first taken, she um, was running, running an errand, and then these guys didn't even ask her where she was going. They just simply didn't say anything. They just um, got in her way and took her away. Yeah. 우리 한국 딸들 가시다가 전체 쏴 죽이고 찔러 죽이고 쟤들 다 이렇게 죽였지. 이 양처럼 내가 어제 그게 사람 살 됩니까? For her it was a nightmare. It was she compares it to a slaughterhouse where their youth, where their sanity, where their purity was taken away forcibly. And she despises every single memory that she has. So what her day was like or what the other girls days were like um, when she was in the comfort home. 이제 위안소에 계실 때 Yes. Um, they interviewed four comfort women and in addition to over uh, 10 war crime survivors in the local area. And I'm glad that this is the first case that um, American students here interview with comfort women in Korea. And we, we are privileged to have this rare opportunity um, to talk with compared women and hear their stories. Here is a, another survivor, Hinam Yu, and our interns, Daniel Lampon and Weiyu Lee. Here is a clip from the interview. <laughs> 왜 엄마가 말이지 왜 그런 사람이었냐고 그래서 네. 이걸 막 우리나라에서 지금 사회에서는 아직도 이 세대로 수치스럽게 생각한단 말이야. 네. 그랬는데 그래서 지금 우리 애들이 나하고 말도 안 붙이는 애들이 있어 딸들이. 아. 그래서 so, 예. 여기서는 생활 예. 뭐 yeah, so her daughters lived in um, New Jersey and Japan and on television she saw these grandmothers po protesting in front of the Japanese embassy and um, she got curious and she went to the embassy to watch the protests the Wednesday protests and when she she asked she asked another gran grandmother, oh, "What are you doing here?" But then uh, she found out that the other grandmothers were comfort women survivors, and she found out about this place. And then after the after that experience, um, she uh, she went back to New New Jersey and back and forth. But in the meanwhile, she was interviewed by a TV crew about her experience as a comfort woman. But that footage was aired on air. It was it was aired and. Her children became aware of this fact, and they, and it blew it blew them away because they were so they became so ashamed of their mother. Before, because um they thought that she was this up you know upright outstanding citizen, but then with this past and she didn't even she didn't even tell them about it, they felt ashamed. And it's been 15 years since she came to this place. And she has terminal, she has, um, well, not terminal, she has lung cancer and she has other, other um, long-term diseases. And to this day, she still, she still doesn't communicate with some of her children. How does she feel about um, Japan not taking responsibility about what happened? 일본이 책임을 회피하는 것에 대해서 어떻게 생각하시나요? 생각 하나만 하건 생각할 여지도 없고 일본 사람들이 사람의 감정이라는 건 똑같다고야 일본이나 미국이나 이 사람은 근데 자기 잘못을 시인하고 서로 말이지 이건 옛날에 전쟁이었으니까 잊어버리고 우리가 말이 좋게 하고 사과하고 이렇게 좋게 하고 살아야지 아니라고 아니라고 이건 세계에서 아는 거 아니야 근데 아니라고 했다는 건그 인간으로서 
있을 수 없는 문제고 어, 나는 지금 여기에 와 있지 이렇게 나눔의 집에서 할머니들하고 생활을 하고 있지만 은 일본 하는 행위에는 그건 인간으로서 도리가 아니라고 예. 생각합니다. 예, 감사합니다. As for her feelings about Japan, she can't give, it's not worth even giving a second thought. She feels that it is their responsibility and they must apologize for it. And she continued on saying that all emotions are alike in every culture. And to deny this fact is simply unacceptable, even as a, um, as a nation as, and as a human being. And she um, said that her the Japan's act is absolutely irresponsible. Yes. Our third interviewee was Il Chul Kang, and our, um, the interviewers were Ashley Ji and Wei Yu Li. She said that she, she realized that she was in hell because she wasn't able to resist, she wasn't able to do anything, she wasn't even able to speak. So what, what would happen is, it would be on, and uh, when she was by herself, she would cry every now and then. But if she was caught crying, they would beat her, saying that, oh, we are feeding you, and we're, pro we're providing you with places to sleep. Why are you crying? that you know tried to escape the comfort zone, the comfort station. 그 위안소에서 탈출 시도가 있었나요? 탈출도 하지도 못해요. 돌아가면 다 군대라. 그랬는데 탈출을 할 수가 없어요. She was surrounded by soldiers and no one attempted to escape. Did you even think about that? 그 탈출하고 싶다는 생각이 드셨지만 그 정말 하자는 생각, 생각을 하셨어요? 해, 그런 생각이 있고 자기 절로 자살도 하고 싶어요. 내가 우리 집에서 옷 사람들은 죽고 밑에 사람이 한 여섯 사람이나 남았는데 형제도 보고 싶고 엄마 아빠 내가 막내이라도 그러니까 보고 싶기도 하고 너무나 막 속이 터지는 것 같아요. 누구한테 말 못해요 그래도. So she thought about escaping. She thought about committing suicide. She missed her family so dearly, but she couldn't tell anyone about it. Okay, our last interviewee was Oksan Park, and uh, interviewers were Jia Longxie and Ashley Ji. Yeah. Yeah, that um, she was taken away, and then she was screaming. She was, she want, she said that she wanted to go home, and the soldier said that if you don't shut up, I'll kill you. Yeah. 
팔찌를 막 차면서 눈에 어째 나가야라 하면서 어째 눈에 그렇게 말아야 되는가 이 우리 하는 대로 따라 들어오면 되겠지 그런가 어떤 큰 부대 집인데 큰 집인데 이 자기 한 자기 방이 있을 때 그래 그 방을 우리 데리고 들어갑니다 우리는 하나도 몰랐지 그러니까 그큰 집은 결국 그때는 에, 사변 나기 전에 애, 내가 어릴 때 그럴 때니까 한장 일본 사람 통칠 때입니다. 그러니까 그곳은 이게 싸마는 전쟁판이란 말입니다. 근데 한장 큰 집인데 그 집은 막, 막 울면서 어, 다섯 개도 콱 그래 하면 소리 주고 일본 사람 소리를 그냥 그렇게. 그래 막 더워 하잖아. 떨리자니까. 우리는 방에 앉아도 못 하죠. 우리 앉아도 떨니까. 일지도 말고, 너네 일지 말고, 방 하나, 하나씩 다 이렇게, 어, 그, 저, 이렇게 사람은, 그런 일분 다듬이 한두 개, 필, 그런 거, 방 하나씩 쪽쪽 찍고, 하나씩 예, 방이니까 들어가라 합니다. 예. 그래, 들어가니까. 잠시만요. So when she, when she got the truck, she saw that she was in a, she was in military barracks, she saw large, she saw this large building. And then the soldiers would, um, the soldiers forced, the, forced them into the building. And they resisted. They were saying, "Save me, save me!" But the soldier, the soldiers, "You're an idiot. Why are you resisting?" And when they went into went into the building, they they went into a big room, and they tried to stay there. But then after a while, they were all divided and put into individual rooms. Yes, uh, as you just saw uh, through interviews, students' interviews, we could clarify. Uh, confirm that all of them were taken to the comfort station against the, their will by the Japanese military. And now I will uh, invite our student interns to the front and uh, let them speak by themselves. Uh, first, Alexander, Lauren, Daniel, Daniela, Eric, and Ziba. Please come up. Please have a seat. Uh, Alexander, um, you interviewed with Oksan, Miss Oksan Lee. Uh, what do you think about the interview and what do you remember the most from the interview? Well, um, I think for me it was extremely touching, but most of all because um, Miss Hudson Lee was taken. Um, she was. Um, so I think for me, um, the most touching part was that uh, when Miss uh, Artsen Lee was taken, she was only 15 years old. And when I was hearing that, for me, I was thinking of my baby sister because she's 14. You know, for me, it's the very concept of taking a 15-year-old girl away from her home, where she had already been uh, kind of traded away by her parents because they couldn't feed her, and her father was a drunk. Um, so she'd already been traded away from her home, but then to take her away from her home country and put her into uh, a foreign country and put her into one of these stations where uh, she was treated brutally. Um, I think for me that was probably the most uh, heart-touching points. Lauren? You interviewed with Miss Lee as well. Do you, what do you remember, and what what is your reaction to the interview? Well, I remember from her is besides being taken away, she had a she couldn't do anything about it. She tried escaping, and she it failed a few times. One time she tried escaping, and one of the soldiers tried c cutting her leg off, but which now causes her to be a like cripple to this day, and it's really sad because. Not knowing what she went through, it's like a hard, tragic mem memory that will always be in with, in with her. Thank you. And uh, Eric and Daniela, you interviewed with um, he Miss Hinam Yu. Uh, what do you remember the most from the interview? And what, what is your reaction? 
Uh, I think for me the most heartbreaking part is when I heard, uh, 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 Yu Yu Hinam grandma, she uh, well her daughter no knew she was a uh, a kung fu woman before, and then she stopped stopped talking with her mother, and that was really touched my heart, and uh, I think I I think. Uh, we we are treating those women so unfairly, and this and this is not their fault, but they carried so much burden on them, and they, they live in shadow, they live in dark, they are all hiding their their past for for all their lives. They are afraid of telling their story to their even their families. Uh, I I think this also because we are because also the women comfort women are relatively known by small amount amount of people and that's cause our our bias and our unfair attitudes towards them and I think uh, this is not not good yeah. thank you Daniela what is your response to the um, well, it was a real honor to interview Miss Yu. Um, I found out that at age 16, she was taken away from her home. And just to think that I'm 18 and that was just me two years ago, I can never imagine going through the things that she went through at such a young age. And to be forced to be taken away from her family and be put in a place that she knew n nothing about. She didn't know where she was. She didn't know anybody. And to find out that she and 16 other women were held against their own will and forced to be comfort women for Japanese soldiers. And also, when she was able to finally leave after the war and return home, that her family knew nothing about what happened to her and that she was actually never able to open up to her parents and explain all the tragedy that she went through, as well as when she got married and moved on um, and tried to put this in the past when she had children, she actually never got to explain to her husband that all the things she went through. And when I was interviewing her, I found out that she found out that there was protests in front of the Japanese embassy. And when she found out that they were for comfort women, she found out that there were other women that shared similar stories and went through what she went through. So while she was there, she did an interview, but it was unknown to her that at the time that it was actually being aired live, and that's the way her children found out, that she never even got the opportunity to actually sit them down and explain to them. So when her children found out through the TV that that's what happened to their mom, she said to us that her children became ashamed of her. And that was one thing that really hit me hard, that her children would actually be ashamed of something that she was forced into. And also um, to hear that she's very sick now and all she really wants is just an apology from Japan. She doesn't want anything. She doesn't want money. She doesn't want anything like that. All she wants is just to hear them take full responsibility and just to apologize. And just to hear that she's in her older years and she still hasn't gotten this apology is very sad to hear. Could I ask a question? Yeah, I, I, excuse me, but there's one question. Daniela, this is the second internship you've had at the Holocaust Center. Last semester, you were in the internship that I ran, having to do with interviewing Holocaust survivors from the Holocaust that took place in Europe. Having had a dual experience of Holocaust survivors in Europe, and you interviewed one very, very intensely, and now you've interviewed one of the comfort women. Do you have any feelings about this experience of seeing both of these people that you interviewed? Well, uh, last semester when I interviewed the Holocaust survivor, Hanny Liebman, um, it's completely different interviewing them. Their stories are both tragic, but they experience different things in different ways. And I feel that Hanny is able to move on because Germany actually came forward and apologized. And I feel that maybe um, Mrs. Yu could have that closure also if Japan came forward and apologized as well. And it was an honor to be able to interview both of them. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Ziba, you interviewed with um, someone in the local area. Can you tell us the stories? Well, my story, basically, I interviewed Mr. He Jun Han. And compared to their stories and all of the comfort women, this guy, he's like around in his 90s now, and he was around 23 at the time of the war. His family wasn't 
affected as badly as these women and he, they didn't really go through much like how everybody else went through and he like his story was basically different because you hear all these stories all the bad things that had ha that has happened to all these women and all the stuff you don't hear about what the others went through and like nothing really happened to them and with that I found interesting with his story is that you were drafted and if you had an odd number you had to you had to serve in the military you would ev eventually be a labor forcer and with him he ran away from that like he didn't want to get drafted and he got drafted and the fact that he got drafted he had to go he like ran away so he didn't well um yeah he like ran away so he didn't have to come back to that and if they got caught they were severely punished and it was pretty interesting i didn't get to go to interview these women but i mean coming from their side their stories that they told me it's different to hear a story that you know someone that wasn't majorly affected and the fact that he had two younger sisters that they didn't have to go through any of that they didn't face any hardships was pretty different yes thank you so much students and uh i will I will invite the second group now. Uh, I will, uh, Ashley, Xiao Long, Eric, and Lee Kwan, please come up. Lee Kwan, please, um, please come up with Mr. Yang, please. sit next to him and explain his uh, stories. And I will, I will ask him if he had any comment on it. On it. Okay, Ashley and Eric interviewed with Ms. Yilchul Kang. Uh, Ashley, can you tell her story, please? Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for coming. Um, so I had the honor to interview Il Chu Kang, and she was born in Sanju, Korea. Um, when I was interviewing her, I found out that she was kidnapped at the age of 15 from her home. She was born out of 10 children. Um, what I found most touching about her story was not only the sacrifices and everything that she went through while she was serving in the comfort stations, but just hearing all of the devastation that she had to go through and bear on her own heart. Um, there was a time where she just wanted to go get water and she wasn't given permission by the soldier. So the soldier beat her and cracked the back of her head open so she had she has a scar on the back of her head just because she wanted to get water. I could never imagine what it would feel like to not have the power to control myself and the what I want to do. And um, she said that there was over 800 women in the comfort station that she was in. Um, when liberation came they were let free, but she wasn't allowed to go back to Korea. So the Chinese government said to her that, well, said to the girls that were there, um, you know, you should, you should study here so you guys can work here. So that's what she did. She worked as a nurse and she ended up getting married and having children. One of the most touching things was that here I am on Skype, Skyping with her all the way across across the world and she's telling me her story and she's never told her whole family because she feels as though her family is going to turn their backs on her. I I just thought that was crazy. Um, yeah. Yes. Thank you. 
Eric, you interviewed with the same person. What do you remember the most from the interview? Well, uh, as uh, as she said, uh, the she was born in 1929 when she was kidnapped. She was 15, and when she uh, when the war was en when the war ended, she tried to go back to the back to her motherland, and she so she went to the Yalu River. Which which is the border of China and the Korea, but the only pathway, the bridge over the Yalu River was closed, and uh, she st stood by the river and she she saw her country just in front of her. He mo almost can can touch her country, but he can't. But he couldn't, and uh, the distance between her and her motherland was just a river, but the river just like an enormous enormous ocean. She she just couldn't go back, and that reminds me of the Berlin Wall in the Germany, and that 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 was a really touching part. And uh, another thing is, uh, when uh, and uh, he hide he also hid his uh, story for her whole life, and but she couldn't but she couldn't she couldn't uh, tolerate the Japan's attitude the Japan. The, that's a twist the history, and by saying Japan doesn't have the responsibility for comfort women, so she so she stand up, she fight against the Japanese uh, prison attitude, and that was uh, and the, and her action just re redefined the word of braveness, and uh, she is one of the bravest uh, per, uh, human being I have ever met. Uh, yeah, I think that's all. Yes, thank you. And for Miss Oxon Park, Jiao Long and Ashley interviewed her. Uh, Jiao Long, uh, what what was the most impressive thing from the yeah, interview? Yeah, I interviewed uh, Oxon Park. Uh, when she le left her hometown, she just uh, fourteen years old, and um, uh, when she grabbed water. Uh, the Japanese soldier come to push her, uh, push her arm and push her on the truck, and uh, she can do nothing to against the Japanese soldier because she just a uh, fourteen years old young girl, and uh, they when they get the uh, comfort station, they just they just uh, push them by Japanese soldier like the little ship. They can do nothing to against to them. And uh, I also can't imagine that Japanese soldier didn't offer any food and drink in the January, and uh, uh, almost uh, 20, 20 girls just uh, stay in the little and dark room without windows, and uh, they just 14 years ago they don't know where they would go, they where where was was the future they will be. And uh, they just sent to the strange, per uh, strange place, with all their family, with their their brother friends. They know nothing about the place. Yeah, I feel sad about that. Thank you, Ashley. You interviewed with the same person, Miss Park. Do you? Uh, what was your reaction to the interview? Um, I mean, like. Like all of the women that I had interviewed, it's very heartbreaking to me to hear these stories all together. Um, Oksum Park, like my fellow colleague, had stated that she was kidnapped just going to go as an ordinary day to go get water from the well, and um, she was grabbed from behind. She had said that she was first put onto a regular Jeep and then transferred to a military truck and brought to um, brought to the comfort station, and I'm I'm not sure if everybody knows what happens at the comfort station, but they would have to serve um, as sex slavery as sex slaves to soldiers from day to night and. I really, I could never imagine what, what that would be like from the morning time to the night. You have men coming in repeatedly into your room and you can't do anything about it. Um, 
And like the other survivor that I interviewed, she wasn't able to go back to her hometown. I wouldn't, I wouldn't know what it would feel like and if I wasn't able to see my family or I didn't know what was happening to them. But her story was very touching. Yes, thank you. And Lee Kwan, you interviewed with Mr. Liang, who is sitting next to you. And can you tell us your story, her, his story? And you are from Hong Kong, and he's from Hong Kong too. And what do you know now that you didn't know uh, before to, you took this program? Um, like at first, I have to say that like when I first hear the so story, you know, like World War II, everybody knew that, and the comfort woman and the Everything that Japan's Japanese soldier did, we knew that. But you know, it's so different. Like in here, about in the Holocaust Center, what I learned and Mr. Kim told us, and the movie we heard is in English. And right now, we're right here, Mr. Le, he speak Cantonese, and I speak Cantonese. And so when he told me his story, it the feeling is so different. Because you know, in English, you have to like translate to your own language. But now you have some a person like face to face, and he used the language what you have know everything like until now, and it's so different. Even though um like he is not have so special story, so horrible, um so. Like that horrible, like the comfort woman, like they is so, like the comfort woman is, we know it's so bad for the one woman. But now you see a person face to you and use your language to talk to you. You can't explain that feeling. And what his story is like, first he was born in Guangzhou in China. However, because he moved to, his whole family moved to Hong Kong because China is not safe wasn't safe at that time. And then like he, his father thought that Hong Kong would be a good place cause during that time Hong Kong wasn't um, like Japan, Japanese um, didn't attack Hong Kong. So it's still safe. However, like when they went to Hong Kong, like few, some two years later, um, Mr. Lung's sister born in Hong Kong. And then like around uh, years later also, uh, in Hong Kong, somebody said, that newspaper said, Japan is going to attack Hong Kong. So they went to their, like his father, Mr. Lung's father said, they moved to their, uh, his friend's house, which is up on the mountain because uh, what, happened that time was saying that Japan Japanese soldier will would come from the sea. So they went up to the mountain. Thought that will like would be safe a little bit. However uh, the Japanese didn't come from the sea. They come from the mountain. But the lucky thing is for Mr. Lang family was like because the newspaper said uh, the Japanese will come in two days. However, like almost a week later, no, but no, nothing happened. So they thought that they was they were safe, and then they want to back to their house to get money, clothes, um, everything they want, and then back to their friend's house. However, when they just left the house, the house, the Japanese come. And then the first place they went was their friend's house because that was a big, big house and seems like a rich man. So the Japanese soldier went there. And then what they did was like killing people, rap the woman, and then um, do got the money. And then what's the, uh, the thing Mr. Lan told me was like so scary scared me was like um uh the soldier used a wheeling iron they hit the iron and then took the house owner's hand and to hit them 
and then cut them to ask where they hide the money, they put the money, and where it was the woman. Yeah. And then they did that, and then the... Lee Kwan, uh, uh, could you ask Mr. Liang what, uh, what is the most important mo one thing that we should remember from his story? So 他們沒有無辜的,在參謀的,從街號沒東亞公路,你從方塘的人都已經了,從還這樣還是講,我們不能夠,不知道我們所有的人,所有全世界愛好和平的人,記住你都 第二次世界大戰,因為日本仔侵略中國,侵略全世界,呢種罪行,唔單單係我個人,我我哋屋企咁樣嘅漂流,咁樣嘅顛簸都係因為日本仔嘅嘅侵略所誒造成嘅。我
Uh, and we actually all did. My, my colleagues in the assembly, uh, Assemblyman McKim and Braunstein, we just came from Albany. So it's a little warmer down here, but not by much. Uh, but we're happy to be here because this is an extremely important issue. And I, first of all, I want to thank Queensboro Community College, the Kufferberg Holocaust Center, and CASE for bringing this issue to the forefront. It was actually the first time I learned about it when you had the uh, presentation at uh, about a year ago, it was. And you actually had some of the comfort women there from Korea. You know, there's an old expression um, that if we don't learn from the mistakes of the past, we're doomed to repeat them. We have situations across the world today where women's rights are being taken away. The comfort women situation is just one more terrible example of what's being done to women, what was done to women during World War II, and what is happening across the globe as we speak. Um, I had hoped, I had hoped to have a resolution that I could present to you and case today from the Senate and the Assembly. Um, unfortunately, there is some dispute about the wording. Um, the Senate has a long-standing policy about not allowing resolutions to be introduced in the Senate that have to do with international relations. So we're still trying to work out the wording, but I can tell you from my colleagues in the Assembly, and Assembly uh, Levine is introducing it in the Assembly because his district um, includes the Westbury Comfort Women Memorial. Um, and I'm trying to do, introduce it in the Senate. We will get this done. It is extremely important for New York State to recognize what happened, and it is extremely important, and I can't overemphasize this, and I know my colleagues will back me up when they speak, for Japan to apologize. There are very few women who experienced this terrible tragedy who are still left alive. We owe it to them, Japan owes it to them, to give them an apology. And, and I, as I'm sure all of you were very moved by the testimony of these women, um, especially um, the, the woman who found, you know, was interviewed on TV and her children learned about it from the TV and her children were just so embarrassed that she had gone through this and now her children don't talk to her. I, I think that's just horrendous, absolutely horrendous. And we must do everything to encourage Japan to apologize. This is not a reflection on Japan as it currently exists today. It is not a reflection on Japanese citizens today. But it is a recognition of what happened during World War II. Germany has officially apologized for what happened during the Holocaust. Japan can do the same. Before I conclude, I do have some certificates for your students. I don't know if you want to give them out later. or We'll give them out later. But I do want to recognize the students who went through this program. You did a great job, and you helped memorialize what happened to these women and what happened during World War II. So I want to congratulate you, and I'm, I know you'll get my certificates of recognition from the Senate later on. Tony, thank you. <laughs> Senator, thank you very much. Uh, and now I'd like to introduce a, a gentleman who didn't have far to travel, just from downtown Manhattan, who has been with us from the very, very first day. Uh, part of my job is to go around meeting with various legislators to get support for the various programs we have. And the very first one I met two years ago was uh, New York City Council Member Peter Koo. And I sat down and told him what we wanted to do, and he, he said, I never heard about this. And uh, he just stood up and he took it, you know, took the, what they say, the reins, and has really led um, a tremendous effort on this. And I'd like to introduce Councilman Peter Koo. Thank you, Dr. Flute and Dr. Uh, Koo. Uh, uh, hello, everyone, ladies and gentlemen, uh, distinguished uh, community leaders. Uh, my colleagues in government. Uh, we were very moved uh, to the stories by the students, and this is something uh, we all ought to, to learn from history so that you won't repeat again. So I don't want to uh, talk too much. Sen um, Senator um, Havala, uh, he already said a lot already. So uh, we have to be uh, together 
I make sure we um, remember these things. No? Uh, we're going to uh, make a memorial garden, and, and we want to make sure we pass a street sign in their honor, too. So these are the things we will do. And, and, and we were very sorry that things happened in the past that hurt so many people, uh, especially uh, uh, children wouldn't talk to their grandmother. That was terrible, you know, if things. Uh, I wouldn't want to ha things uh, happen to my grandmother or myself like that. So I, all, I, I hope all of us learn from this. And that's why we have Holocaust Center. And that's why we have history in colleges, to remind uh, people about uh, tragedies uh, before. So uh, I want to thank Queens uh, Borough Community College for doing this, and, and Dr. Flood, and, and also Case, for doing this wonderful work so the future generations uh, will not repeat the same mistakes uh, they did uh, 50, 60, or 100 years ago. Uh, so uh, this is not only a women's issue, this is a human rights issue. Uh, this is uh, this uh, this is a very terrible thing happened, and uh, I hope uh, Japan will somehow uh, come up and apologize to the people, to the comfort women. Uh, so, but we have to work hard uh, to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Council. Uh, we hope the members of the legislature will stay because we, it's not official unless we take a picture. And we want you to do that. And I'd like to call another friend of the Kupferberg Holocaust Center, Assemblyman Ron Kim. Thank you, Arthur. Um, I also want to thank uh, Dr. Cole and Arthur Flug for just doing an amazing job at the Holocaust Center. And of course, the Korean American Community Empowerment, Mr. Kim, Mrs. Lee, and Mr. M, everybody here, the staff, uh, for doing an amazing job. Um, and of course, my colleagues in government as well. Um, you know, I share something very similar, uh, actually, with the interns uh, or, or the students, um, the nine students who had uh, the first semester in this program. Many years ago, um, I was actually in South Korea with the delegate of Asian Americans, um, and we visited a number of places, including the, the South Korean version of the White House, um, like Samsung Building, but the one place that stood out the most. We actually visit the Comfort Woman uh, Community Center. It's a nonprofit organization in Seoul, which is kind of like a museum. It's kind of like this, where it captures um, everything in one place, the memories and the pictures and the stories of this Comfort Woman. And we actually met uh, face to face, one of the Comfort Women. Um, and I didn't, in none of us, you know, we didn't see a Comfort Woman, we saw a grandmother. You know, we saw our grandmother um, not only you know requesting an apology, but just really want to connect and share the story uh, to the next generation. Um, and half the room was in tears. You know, by the time uh, she was done uh, telling her story, so we left uh, many years ago that place. And a lot of my friends, what we did, um, we got involved. You know, we 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 stayed involved and we helped the hundreds and thousands of women currently, you know, in. Uh, in, in poor places and, and being exploited as women and really, you know, honored the memories of comfort women by helping the women now who are struggling. Um, you know, advocacy is important. You know, we want to make sure that uh, the international community is accountable for what happened in history, but it's also important to honor these women by getting involved in the future. Whatever paths that you guys may take, um, it's important to get involved and, and, and help. So, you know, I want to thank the program and I want to thank the students uh, for this wonderful collaboration. Thank you. Um, and I do have certificates for all the students uh, from the, on behalf of the assembly as well. So uh, put them on your walls, all right? Thanks. <laughs> thank you, Ron. And now uh, another true friend of the Holocaust Center. Um, I'd like to say something about Assemblyman uh, Ed Bronson. He has never missed an event. He has absolute perfect attendance. I don't know what that's going to get you when you campaign, but we're, we're delighted that you're always here with us. Thank you very much. Uh, I also would like to thank Queensborough Community College and Dr. Call and Dr. Flug, uh, and also Case and, and Mr. Kim for, for bringing this program here to Queens, the first of its kind, as you said, in, in probably the Western Hemisphere. Uh, so we, we appreciate all, all the work that you've done. 
Uh, w when you look at history at events like the Holocaust or, or what happened with the Comfort Women, it's amazing about how horrible mankind can be to each other during times of conflict. And if we don't talk about what happened in the past and we don't uh, bring it out into the public, uh, not only are we likely to have history repeat itself, but also there is no uh, pressure to those um, who committed these crimes uh, to apologize and they could feel that they could sweep it under the rug. So I, I wanna thank the interns for the work that they did today. And uh, we also owe a, a particular debt of gratitude to the survivors uh, for their bravery to to speak out. It's, it's tough when someone's been through a trauma, they wanna forget the events, and it's tough to reach back and bring that out. But through their bravery, um, hopefully, uh, we will continue to keep up the p public pressure on Japan to give a formal apology, and also, hopefully, uh, through their efforts, uh, we will prevent uh, crimes like this from happening uh, in the future. So I, I wanna thank everybody again, and uh, it was a pleasure to, to be here for this. Thank you. Thank you. Ed. Thank you very much. There are a few other legislators that were not able to be here today for very important reasons. Uh, this afternoon I received a call from Grace Meng, newly elected member of Congress. She's working on something called the Fiscal Cliff, and she's unable to be here tonight, but she did send recognition to you. Also uh, representing uh, New York City Controller John Liu, Barbara Baruch. It's a assemblyman, uh, no, city council member Mark Weprin had a previous engagement tonight, but he also sent uh, his regards. Did I miss anybody? And what I'd like to do now is I'd like all of the student interns to please come up. Uh, student interns, Dr. Cole, would you join us in this? And I like Mr. Kim and our elected officials. Let's take a group picture with the elected officials and then we'll take one of each with each elected official. This way. Oh. Come. Yeah. Well. Okay, that's it, guys. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to call up someone here, Austin Schaffron, friend of mine, community organizer. Austin, I'd just like to come up and have him recognize you being here, formerly the governor's staff, and he will be working with us in the Korean community. I'd like to also point out two things. Number one, if I have your attention, when you leave, out in the lobby is an enormous, enormous exhibit of the Korean Comfort Women, and the artist Steve Cavallo would be there. And now I'd like to call up for a final part, the true friend, Miss Young Young. Here you are, please. Okay. For understanding of a past, and learning about diversity and people's story of today and better future of peace and harmony, we sing these songs for you.
And thank you all for coming. And this is the first of many. The interns, I'd like you to come with me right now, okay? Right. Okay.